Welcome to Relationships 101. I'm Dr. Donna Tonry, and I'm the director of the Counseling and Family Therapies Master's Program here at LaSalle University. I'm very pleased to be with you today, and also pleased to have Dr. Michael Sood and Dr. Dina DiNardo joining me for a conversation about relationships. Both Dr. Sood and Dr. DiNardo are licensed marriage and family therapists, and they teach in our Marriage and Family Therapy Master's Program. Today, we will discuss the importance of effective communication in healthy relationships. Welcome, Mike and Dina. To begin today's discussion, um, I thought it might be good to give our audience a little bit of a background of how the marriage and family therapy field is connected to and kind of, in a sense, came from the communication field. Mike, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I think some of the things that um, our uh, grandparents in the field um, noticed mm -hmm. um, and started to form theory and understand relationships was about the ways people responded to each other, so the language they used, mm -hmm. and how they talked to each other. So kind of those, right. those audio-visual cues that go along with language um, really shape exper you know, people's experiences and interactions and really helped us understand what was happening um, in right. interactions. Right. Um, hmm. Do you, do you have an example of something that w might demonstrate how that might look? Um, that's a good question. So I, I think as far as the how um, something is said, um, so, so let, me, let me take a step back. I think that language is really important. So when people say, oh, this never happens, or um, you know, you're always this way or something, right. mm -hmm. that can often um, kind of really shape our experiences and how we experience our relationships. And so if we shift with language a bit, you know, sometimes things are this way and sometimes things are this way, right. that often helps right. us feel a lot differently about it. And so I think in those ways, language is really important. Right. Um, as far as the audio-visual cues, I, I was saying, I, I always give this example in class, um, if somebody asks me a question, right. um, you know, can I do this? And I say, well, well that's fine, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I say, you know, ask me again. I say, um, that's fine. The same words right. can have very different meaning mm -hmm. based on the cues that go with them. And often we're, you know, very much attuned to those other cues to make sure. meaning of that statement. Sure. And as I was listening to you and you said an example of never and always, mm -hmm. I, I think people tend to talk in absolutes. Sure. However, I don't think they know that that's what it is. Absolutely. But the person that receives the message hears it as an absolute. So it might not be meant that way, but it's received that way. And then responds a certain way. Exactly. And, and then that starts to shape their interaction right. and this relation. I agree. Right. I often say to students and to clients that uh, so much of the work that we're doing is about communication. We essentially become experts on the way in which people are communicating and so just as Mike's sharing it's a lot less about what's being said as much as um, it's about how it's being said and how it's being received by somebody else sure. and you know just as Mike said the emotional experience of what's being shared. Today what I think I'd like to do is tap a little bit into maybe all three of us but tap into the clinical experience that you have that I have um, so I, and we may tie back into what we're teaching our students because obviously they're becoming clinicians. But I think that our audience can learn a lot from hearing what we experience as clinicians. And one of the things that I see when I'm working with couples, it, it's very common when a couple comes in to say, you know, I will ask, you know, what is it that brings you into therapy? Mm -hmm. And probably the most common answer I hear is communication. We don't communicate well. And then when we begin talking about it, they tend to um, demonstrate that they do talk to each other. So it's not that they're not talking. So it's, you know, they don't you know, spend days not talking to each other, but they're not communicating. So I thought we could maybe talk about how do we help people um, define their own message so that they get, can then better express it. Mm -hmm. do, do you find that in your work, that you're doing that a lot? I definitely do. I find that people often aren't quite listening to what the other person's saying mm -hmm. as much as they're getting ready with what am I going to say next, how am I going to respond, and right. it takes them out of understanding their partner's message and into what is it that I'm going to say to sort of defend my position or to try to counteract what my partner's thinking. Well, that's a really good point because I think when 
for most of us, or at least most people when they're worrying about communication, their mind immediately goes to talking. Mm -hmm. But they don't necessarily pay attention to the other side of it, which is listening. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good point, that listening is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I often think when we ask people if somebody says something and then there's a reaction either that I don't expect or I think that is, you know, intense, I might mm -hmm. ask, you know, what did you hear so-and-so just say? Mm -hmm. And what they will say is something very different than what I heard. Right, um, right. Which doesn't mean it's wrong, it, but it helps me understand, oh, that's why they had that reaction. That's what they heard. Mm -hmm. um, and often I think that that is the meaning they made mm -hmm. of what was said which often right. reflects their, over, you know, their feelings about the relationship and about what's going on. And so that's um, what therapy brings to people's lives is the opportunity to slow down that process and understand how it's operating. And then they start thinking about that outside of the room. So what did I just hear versus what was actually said? Mm -hmm. and so creating that habit for them is definitely uh, significantly related to the, the outcome and the changed way of relating to one another. I have found it to be challenging, exactly the point that the two of you are making. When, when you're sitting with a couple and one person says something and the other person states what they heard mm -hmm. and then we as the therapist sit there and say, well, that's not what I heard, mm -hmm. that can sometimes not be received well mm -hmm. because we're saying, well, we heard it differently and then uh, sometimes the client could take it as we're taking sides mm -hmm. and when we're not, that's not the intent at all, we're just kind of getting to the root of the message. Um, but I find that can be challenging. Have mm -hmm. you had that experience? Yes, mm -hmm. I think I've learned not to do that <laughs> just by <laughs> through experience. Mm -hmm. um, and more being, I, I guess from my end, being curious about how they got that message. Because um, I, mm -hmm. I guess I believe that that person probably has good reasons for making mm -hmm. meaning of it that way. So if they felt attacked, right. I might not have experienced the message as attacking. However, my guess is they're feeling that way in, in other areas mm -hmm. of the relationship that, that you know, we see so little, I think, as therapists. Um, right. So that's why I feel like we never really understand at some level what they're experiencing. And so right. I, it's just helped me to remain curious about how that person experienced the relationship and how they got to that point of, you know, well, that was attacking. Mm -hmm. right. if, yeah. yeah, two thoughts come to mind. First, that we put in a great deal of effort building our relationships with our clients, getting to know them, uh, understanding where they're coming from. And because we do a particularly good job at building these relationships, we're offering clients an opportunity to be heard in a way that they're not feeling heard by their partner. Mm -hmm. And so we're building very good rapport early on. And I firmly believe that it's not until a client can feel heard that they're able to truly hear somebody else. So we sort of mm -hmm. start that process, we set the, the foundation for them. And then once we're working on the actual couple, partner to partner right. communication, mm -hmm. we're getting to the core of what they're feeling. So as Mike is pointing out, well, I felt attacked. That's important, that's meaningful. And right. we don't invalidate the experience of feeling attacked. In fact, we validate it more. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they're not talking about, well, I'm feeling attacked when they're not in the therapy room. Right. And so it gives us an opportunity to peel back that layer and get mm -hmm. to that sense of vulnerability. One thing that I have found to be helpful is when, especially if I'm in a challenging situation with a couple, and they're, we're in the moment and they're communicating and maybe not so effectively and they're feeling things and it's getting intense, that sometimes I wanna go back and say, okay, how about we look at the bigger context? Because oftentimes we're sitting and talking about a message that they have in the moment, but that message is connected back, maybe it has a long history. Maybe it's a month, maybe it's six months, maybe it's five years. And when we start pulling back and creating a bigger context, that often can help. Do you find that that helps as well? What would you say? Um, I, I would say that it absolutely does, because often, um, what they're talking about is like this microcosm of a larger issue. So, so, right. so they're getting into this conversation, you know, an argument about, I don't know, um, making dinner or um, going to one of their parents' houses right. or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's often not about the dinner or the visit. Um, it's some, you know, bit larger theme in the relationship right. Right. about someone not feeling important or heard mm -hmm. or um, valued or, mm -hmm. or something. And, and that's, I think, what Dina's saying. That's the stuff that is often below the surface. 
And right. I think it's I think that's so important to be kind of stepping back and, and trying to talk about those larger themes that, like you're saying, they're not talking about on a regular basis, um, and maybe they're not even aware of. Right. That's definitely the, uh, a major part of understanding what's going on for a couple, exploring that context. So what was happening immediately before you had this conversation? What was happening that morning? What was mm -hmm. happening the night before? Because sometimes people come in and they're so focused on the actual exchange that felt difficult or felt mm -hmm. hurtful, mm -hmm. and they have a hard time zooming out and connecting the dots and making sense of things. So that's where I think we're really, really helpful mm -hmm. to them. And the context, too, at times could be that however this person is speaking to them may trigger something from their past that is not at all connected to this person, but now they're connecting this feeling that they have maybe from another relationship that maybe was conflictual sure. or maybe not real secure, or it could have been a parent relationship, it could be another intimate relationship, and then they're projecting that feeling from the past onto the current situation. Right. Absolutely. So as marriage and family therapists, we very much believe that we learn how to communicate in the environment in which we grew up. Right. And so we're used to that way of communicating. And sometimes we find ourselves in relationships where we're noticing that similar pattern of communication because it's familiar, because that's what makes sense to, the, to us or to them. Sure. And that feels, it feels good until it doesn't anymore. And so we have to think about the ways in which we're responding based on history. And I think that can create a challenge for us as the therapist to examine what's happening, be able to help the client go back into their family relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but we always have to be careful that we're not attempting to blame anybody. Sure. We're really just trying to explain. So it's not about blame, sure. it's about explaining. And explaining what they experienced, what they learned, and even to understand that whoever taught them that probably learned it themselves mm -hmm. as well in, in some relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Don, I think you're making such an important point about not blaming. Mm -hmm. That's one of, the, yeah. one of the most important things that we can do is share responsibility. Right. And as you can see, there is a lot to talk about when it comes to relationships and communication. We will take a short break, and when we come back, we will continue our conversation. Hey, did you hear what happened to Derek this weekend? Yeah, I can't believe his friends just left the night. Did they not see how sick he was? I guess they didn't want to get in, in trouble for like underage drinking and like they yeah. probably thought they would get like arrested or something, but still. Well, there is this thing called the Medical Amnesty Act. I've never heard of that. What is that? Well, basically, if your friend is drinking underage, you can help them out without getting in trouble if they need medical attention. Oh, so it makes people more willing to help people who might have alcohol poisoning exactly. and not worry about getting in exactly. trouble. and it can save so many lives. Yeah, definitely. The Center for Disease Control reports that on average, alcohol is a factor in over 4,358 deaths in young people under 21. This number can be greatly reduced with responsibility, the Medical Amnesty Act, and the understanding that helping a friend is the most important thing.
Welcome back to Relationships 101. I'm your host, Dr. Donna Tonry, the director of the LaSalle University's Counseling and Family Therapy Master's Program. Joining me to discuss healthy relationships and the importance of effective communication are Dr. Michael Sood and Dr. Dina DiNardo. So, to continue our conversation, I was thinking that it might make sense for our audience if we were to do a role play. Um, one of the things that I have found is uh, really challenging to help clients um, be able to speak in an I statement, say what their thoughts are, say what their feelings are, and obviously first we have to get them to get to their thoughts and feelings, and then keep it there when they're speaking to um, a spouse, a partner, a colleague. Um, one of the things that gets in the way typically is their feelings. So they begin to operate through their feelings instead of through their message. So I'd like to do a role play. So if I gave you a kind of a scenario and the two of you could demonstrate how people you tend to use you statements and then I'll kind of direct you back to I statements. So you want to try this? Sure. Okay, so we'll, we'll just try and see where it goes. Okay, so the scenario I'm thinking of is let's Let's pretend the two of you are a couple, and you've talked about um, planning a getaway for the two of you. And you've talked and you've talked and you've talked, but you've never planned it. And every time you go to plan it, it tends to end up in disagreement and it gets dropped. So now you're sitting here in therapy and you want to plan this getaway, um, but you're going to start by speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. So either one of you could start in the, in the scenario, and then I'd like you to stay in the you statements, mm -hmm. and then I'll interject. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're saying that you want to go on a vacation, and I don't see anything happening with it. I'm not really sure that you actually want to go on a vacation. You don't seem to be making much initiative to make that happen. Well, I, I think I'll take initiative when you tell me what your schedule is. You never tell me when you can take off, so you know, in order to start, we have to know when to go, but you never give me that. Mm. I've absolutely given you my schedule several times. I've texted it to you. You don't read your texts from me. You don't read your emails from me. No, I, I read them, and I tell you that your messages aren't clear. You say something like, well, I might have this you know, Friday off, or I, I might be able to, well, might, you know, I don't know if I can make uh, plans, you know, based on that. Well, I think that you tend to sort of exaggerate the vagueness of my emails. I mean, I'm, I'm very good at, at being concise about things, and you, you know, you read what, what you want to read, and if you don't want to go on the vacation, then you don't. Yeah. I think if you really wanted to go, you would just say, I'm taking this time off, and you would make this a priority and not what's going on at work. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to interject now. Okay, so I listened to the two of you, and each of you made a very clear you statement. So you both told each other what the other is doing or not doing. So now, Dina, I want you to take your same message. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not sure you delivered your message, ac actually, but I want you to go to your message and speak just from yourself. Not, n do not use the word you. Do not tell Mike what he's doing or not doing. Mm -hmm. You're just going to express what's happening for you. Mm -hmm. So see how you can do it putting that into an I statement. Okay. I feel disappointed that we haven't had a vacation together. Okay. Now can you respond to that with an I statement? I think if you're that disappointed, you would have done it differently. Okay, so let's stop right there. <laughs> that was a very good I slash you statement. Okay, so now take the same statement, mm -hmm. take, take what's happening for you, your response to Dina, and put it in only an I statement. Um, I wish our relationship could be more of a priority to you. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge that one a little bit because I, see if you can try putting it simply I statement. No you in there. Um, it, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I get upset um, when I feel like this isn't important to you. Okay. When I get that message from you. Excellent. Okay, so now can you respond to him? Well, I don't feel like you communicate that to me. How about, try one more time, just speaking from you. 
I feel unaware of that. Okay. I'm supposed to respond. You're respond back. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I have, um, but maybe I haven't been clear, or maybe I haven't said it strongly enough. So you know what's interesting about this is when he talks to me in that way, I feel completely different. And mm -hmm. so I want to respond to him in a much more caring way. I want to take care of his feelings more. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel totally different mm -hmm. about him. It's amazing how the language can do that. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting, I mean, I know that you're role playing and there isn't an emotional reality here. Mm -hmm. However, when you were doing the first role play, it was very clear to see. If I, now I was planning on seeing three statements each and then I would interject, but if, if I really just sat back and let it go, you may not have actually been feeling it, but it would have escalated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it was beginning to escalate into something that wasn't really about the message, mm -hmm. because both were getting, both of you were getting away mm -hmm. from what the message is, which is planning a, a getaway for the two of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely true. I think, like for my character, um, I think it's it's. Um, for so, I've just worked with so many people mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. where it's very hard to say. Um, I really want to do this with you, like mm -hmm. so, you know what I mean. This is really important to me, mm -hmm. and it, it hurts me. It bothers me. It you know makes me wonder how important it is to you. You know when it, when it feels like it's not a priority to you, and mm -hmm. I get kind of nervous and worried. Mm -hmm. um, that's hard to say. Mm -hmm. I mean that's very vulnerable. That's very that's risky. Very, mm -hmm. it's very risky, and there has to be a certain amount of trust that the other person's going to be able to respond in a way that doesn't make you feel worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I see this so often, mm -hmm. and it doesn't even have to be that the other person's in the room. Sometimes I'm working with an individual client, and they're just expressing what their situation is, and when they're even expressing it with the person not there, they're saying that this person did that, said that, you know, is thinking that, is yeah. everything that the other person's doing, and they're not getting to, the, to what their own message is. And so it can be a little threatening for clients, I think, sometimes, to get to their own message. Because once they get to it, I, I think what happens is they have to own it. Yes. Now they have to do something. They don't have to do something with it. But if they don't do something with it, then it kind of takes away the complaint. Because if they get to the message, if they get what's really happening for them, and they don't do anything about it, then it's up to them to accept it or to not accept it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Hmm. So is there anything in particular that you do to help people to find it easy, find an easier path to that I statement, to their own um, core of their message? That's a good question. I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of things that I do. I mean, I think what, what, based on what you're saying, I want mm -hmm. people to own their experience. I want them mm -hmm. to own how they've made sense of what they've heard. I want them to own their feelings about it, their mm -hmm. thoughts about it, and mm -hmm. the way that their behaviors, so usually, right. the, which are words, the way they're responding or, or any other behaviors that go with right. that. Um, that's what I want, mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that's usually a path, and that, that's hard to do. I, if, mm -hmm. if it, it, w we would not be sitting here if mm -hmm. that was easy to do. Right. Um, so I, I, think, I think the first thing is to just help people understand that their behaviors are their responsibility. So rather than you know, we hear things like, you know, she makes me angry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, anger is one way to experience her. That there are other ways, you know, so, and that is the way. So, so helping mm -hmm. people just make some, you know, just take some responsibility for the mm -hmm. way that they're responding, I think is really important. And that, that takes a long time usually. Mm -hmm. And so I usually yeah. ask, you know, a lot about, um, Often their families, how they learned mm -hmm. that stuff, what their experiences have mm -hmm. been. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I find that asking couples or any relationship that I'm working with, how would you know that you were being heard? Right. What are the cues that this person's hearing you? What, what would you notice in their body language, in their eye contact? What could they say to let you know that they're actually hearing you? Mm -hmm. And how do you know what you need in the moment? And I find that really. Mm -hmm. gives people pause and has them stop and think about what cues would I need. Mm. 
It's interesting, Mike, when you mentioned anger. I have found often with clients that sometimes they don't experience that their anger is honored. And they express it to someone, and maybe not so well, and maybe it's in a you statement, but they express it, and then they don't feel that it's honored or validated or heard. And then obviously the anger escalates. And before you know it, it's anger on top of anger on top of anger. And it makes it that much harder to you know, get down into what was the original issue. Mm -hmm. And yep. it, that can be really difficult for people. And, and it can be painful, painful to get to that original issue. I, I completely agree. Because like even in this, even though it's a role play, even in this interaction, like when I start saying, you know, well, well, you never take time for work. If you if you had responded like you were saying to me, it, you know, when you respond to you had said to me, "You're upset. What's going on?" Mm -hmm. It totally changes the interaction. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So just being yep. attuned to people, you know, to your partner's experiences and, and curious and interested mm -hmm. is so so important. It is. It's mm -hmm. so important. And that's where the therapy comes in, being able to model mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. teaching people right. how mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. So even if we take the risk that we have two people in front of us and we have to say that we heard something differently, then we have to be able to validate that as well. Absolutely. So obviously we can go on and on, um, but now we need to end. And we hope you have enjoyed today's conversation on Relationships 101. You can reach us by going to our website at lasalle.edu slash grad MFT or lasalle.edu slash grad CFT to learn more about our programs. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you.